Howard Hughes was born on Christmas Eve in 1905 into a family who ran a very successful oil tool business. He inherited that business when he turned 18. His parents had died the year before, and just like that, he was a millionaire. With his new wealth, he decided to fund a few films rather than focusing on managing the family business. His most popular movie was Hell's Angels, the World War I flying epic which fueled Hughes' interest in aviation. It cost around $4 million to make, about $54 million today, and also grossed about $8 million, among other exploits helping to catapult Hughes into one of the most well-known men of his era. But we're not here to talk about Hughes' life, but rather his death and what happened after to his massive fortune. You see, over his lifetime, Hughes's wallet became one of the fattest of his time. It isn't exactly known how much he was worth at the time of his death, but as we've mentioned in a video before, that time Howard Hughes purchased a TV station so he could have Netflix in the 1960s, this was a guy who, when the manager of the Desert Inn in Vegas, Mo Dalitz, ordered him to leave the hotel, Hughes responded that it'd do no such thing. And then, in a move straight out of Hollywood, he simply offered to buy the hotel. Hotel. Ultimately, a price tag of $13 million, about $93 million today, was agreed upon, and well, he was able to stay. And if you're wondering about the whole 1960s Netflix thing, basically, very briefly, not long after the hotel incident, Hughes decided to buy a Channel 8 KLAS TV for $3.6 million, about $24 million today, just so he'd have something to watch 24 hours a day if he wanted, as at the time there was no 24 hour TV station in Vegas. The night shows were then just just a selection of his favorite movies without any ads. As noted by a former employee of KLAS TV in Howard Hughes, the Las Vegas years, the women, the Mormons, the Mafia, my job at the station was to direct the 5, 6, and 11 o'clock news, but I was also in charge of Hughes's films. Each day, I would write a synopsis of the shows and movies he wanted to see and send it to him at the penthouse. Sometimes he would change his mind and call the studio or have an aide call the studio to change the movie we had scheduled to run. Indecision from the penthouse seemed to be the only course of action in those days. The station in question was able to get around some of the legal issues that can pop up when broadcasting movies they wouldn't otherwise have the rights to because Howard Hughes also owned one of the Big Five Hollywood Studios, RKO Films, that had a very large catalogue of films available. The funny thing about all of this was that Hughes didn't just change the movie schedule before the broadcast as the KLAS TV employee referenced. You see, he would frequently zone out when watching movies, either because he was catching a rare moment of sleep or was distracted by something or maybe just got up to do something else. When this happened, Hughes was known to call up the station and make them play the scene that he'd missed again, sometimes doing this multiple times. Other times, if he got bored with a particular film, it asked them to put on a different movie entirely, even in the middle of another film, basically treating the entire station like a very expensive 1960s version of a personal Netflix account. As you might have guessed from all of this, he was flush with cash, further evidenced by when, ten years before his death, he was forced to sell his shares in the airline company T. WA. The payout? $546 million, about $3.8 billion today, estimated by some to have been about 25-30% to of his net worth at the time. Okay, so this all brings us to his death. When he died, there was one major problem. Howard Hughes had no direct descendants or immediate family, and he didn't leave behind a will. At least, that's what the authorities were forced to conclude after an extensive search for one. After contacting his various banks, lawyers, and employees, every hotel he'd ever stayed in, posting classifieds in various newspapers, and even consulting a psychic, they were forced to accept that settling the massive estate was not going to be an easy matter. So, just where did all of the money go after his death? Most assumed Hughes wanted the money to go to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. It was well known that he didn't want the money falling into the hands of any distant relatives, but without any hard evidence, distant cousins and others began grabbing for that cash. A battle ensued between the temporary administrator of the Hughes estate, cousin and lawyer William Lummis, and those who ran the Medical Institute. There was a multi-state war with Nevada, California, and Texas, all claiming to be responsible for the distribution of the state, and all of which had their own 
own laws about inheritance. While the various parties were fighting it out, a couple of different wills surfaced, though eventually they were thrown out as fakes. A notable one was the three-page document that declared Melvin DeMar, a gas station attendant, was to inherit one-sixteenth of Hughes's fortune. Supposedly, DeMar once picked up Hughes off the side of the road and gave him a ride to his hotel, and Hughes was so grateful that he left DeMar a huge chunk of money. In 1978, the will was thrown out as a forgery. Next, various wives started emerging from Hughes's past, taking advantage of his reclusive reputation to explain why no one had heard of them before. Terry Moore, an actress, claimed to have married Hughes twice, but provided no documentation to support her assertions. She did, in fact, once live with Hughes in the 1940s, but her claim that they were not only married, but never divorced, was called into question given the fact that she married three times after her supposed marriage to Hughes. Nevertheless, she must have put forward a good argument, or at least pestered the estate managers so much that they decided to pay her just to get rid of her, because she was paid $400,000 by the estate. Later Moore wrote a book titled Beauty and a Billionaire, which made the bestseller list, likely aligning her pockets a bit more. In addition to supposed wives, an extraordinary number of Hughes' supposed children decided to acknowledge their deceased father. One was said to be the love child of Hughes and Amelia Earhart, even though Earhart never had any children. More on Earhart in the bonus facts in a bit, by the way. At least two supposed children of Hughes were black, but their claims were thrown out among other reasons because Hughes was known to be an incredible racist. After years of struggle trying to sort the people with legitimate claims from the fakers who were in it to try and grab some of the cash, a lot of the money did end up going to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. However, a huge chunk of it also went to various Hughes heirs. According to the Wall Street Journal, around a thousand people have benefited from the estate, including 200 of Hughes's distant relatives. After liquefying many of his assets, this group was collectively awarded about $1.5 billion. Interestingly, the liquidation of the estate wasn't completely finalized until 2010, 34 years after his death. The last piece of the puzzle was the Summerlin Residential Development. In 1996, Rusco, now General Growth, agreed to buy the Summerlin lands from the Hughes estate on a 14-year repayment plan. With that, finally, the estate of Howard Hughes was laid to rest. And now for a bonus fact. Speaking of Amelia Earhart, publisher and promoter George P. Putnam fell in love with Earhart while he was married to the daughter of one of the creators of Crayola Crayons. The two had an unhappy marriage, and when Putnam was helping Earhart write a book, the two fell in love. After Putnam got divorced shortly thereafter, he proposed to Amelia Earhart six times before she finally accepted. And with that, we have this rather fascinating letter Amelia Earhart gave to her new husband on their wedding day, in which Earhart wrote, You must know, again, my reluctance to marry. I feel the move just now was foolish as anything I could do. I know there may be compensations, but have no heart to look ahead. On our life together, I want you to understand that I shall not hold you to any medieval code of faithfulness to me, nor shall I consider myself bound to you similarly. If we can be honest, I think the difficulties which arise may best be avoided should you or I become interested deeply or in passing with anyone else. Please let us not interfere with the other's work or play, nor let the world see our private joys or disagreements. In this connection, I may have to keep some place where I can go to be myself now and then, for I cannot guarantee to endure at all times the confinement of even an attractive cage. I must exact a cruel promise, and that is, you will let me go in a year if we find no happiness together. I will try to do my best in every way and give you that part of me you know and seem to want. Also extremely odd for her time, she chose not to take her new husband's name. They also didn't bother with any honeymoon or anything, both going right back to work after their weekend wedding, her on a flight tour and him back to his day job. It all worked out though, once she saw her husband really did want her as she was and wasn't in the slightest bit interested in interfering with her work or her being an extremely atypical wife for the age. She would state a few years later, I had no special feelings about Mr. Putnam at first. I was too absorbed in the prospects of the trip and my being the one to make it. Of course, after I talked to him for very long, I was conscious of the brilliant mind and keen insight of the man. We came to depend on each other, yet it was only friendship between us, or so at least I thought at first. At least I didn't admit even to myself that I was in love, but at last the time came. I don't quite know when it happened, when I could deceive myself no longer. I couldn't continue telling myself that what I felt for GP was only friendship. I knew I had found the one person who could put up with me. 
And finally, to conclude this bonus fact, a great quote from Earhart after crossing the Atlantic solo and so becoming the first person to cross Baia twice. She stated, If there is anything I have learned in life, it is this. If you follow the inner desire of your heart, the incidentals will take care of themselves. If you want badly enough to do a thing, you usually do it very well, and a thing well done, as a society is organized, usually it works out to the benefit of others as well as yourself. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out a new channel I'm working on called Business Plays? It's like this. It's a little bit more laid back though, but still full of facts and a little bit of fun. I'm linking to it below and thank you for watching.